Thank you for joining us tonight at the Live from the Library program. My name is Lisa Wren, and I'd like to welcome you. Uh, and to first uh, thank tonight's sponsors. They are the East Bay Times, the Minutemen Press Lafayette, and the Friends of the Walnut Creek Library. Um, also, another quick housekeeping thing, please turn your phones off if you haven't already. I'm going to make a couple of commercial pitches because they're very pertinent to why what we're doing tonight and why we are why we are able to have great programming like this. And uh, uh, so, first of all, next month we have a, another wonderful program. It's called Fresh Ink, and it is uh, new music, which is going to be a conversation with the California Symphony Music Director Donato Cabrera and uh, Catherine Balch, who is the young uh, the young comp American composer in residence that is part of the uh, the California Symphony and uh, violinist Robin Bollinger. Um, also, the Walnut Creek Library Foundation, which produces this program, will be hosting its 10th annual Authors Gala next month on April 27th. And this year we have 22 authors attending the event, each with a new book to showcase and discuss with whoever wants to discuss it with them. Uh, the, the authors are also seated at tables, and you can ask to be, you can request a table, I believe. But I, there's more more information it can be is available out there. But uh, it's just a really nice evening. It's a lot. It's good food. It's fun. It's great conversation. And in fact, I met one of tonight's guests, Emily. Last year, I was at her table, and that is part of why we have this program here tonight. And uh, better yet, Laura who's the other author here tonight, she will be at, she will be at this year's gala. So with Come her books. Come be at my table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is, the gala is the foundation's lar single largest fundraising event of the year. And those funds help support programs like this and a bunch of other stuff that goes on at the library. Uh, tickets go on sale Monday. Uh, there's information out in the back and on the web foundation uh, website. But let's get to why we're here now, because that's why you are here. Uh, we are excited to have these two celebrated authors to discuss their books, their careers, their adventures in produce. Uh, and if you got to sample the shiso limeade and the cookies and crackers that they prepared, and if you didn't, um, sneak back and get something, because it's really, really good. And yes, those really were live flowers on the, on the shortbread uh, candied. And, Emily will talk about those a little later. Um, uh, anyway, you'll have a sense of their creativity and their passion. Um, also, if you have questions, write them down and we'll get to them a little later in the evening. Somebody will come pick them up. Um, so first, we would like to welcome Laura McLively. Laura here. Uh, Hi, thank you. She lives in Oakland and she's a food and nutrition expert with a unique combination of expertise in both clinical and community health. She works at the Native American uh, Health Center in Oakland, right? As of a week ago. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just finished there. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, she did for a long time. I'm moving on to new For things. a long time. Yeah. Um, but she is also, uh, she's also uh, very good at recipe development and food writing. And she is the author of the acclaimed, I have to hold this book up because it's just so gorgeous, Berkeley Bowl Cookbook. Um, and if you live in the East Bay, you probably know about the Berkeley Bowl. It's the iconic uh, uh, grocery store where you can find just about anything if you're going to find it anywhere in the Bay Area, you're going to find it at the Berkeley Bowl. Um, she is also the uh, creator of the, it started, well, she'll tell you how, how the book uh, came out of her blog, but uh, uh, she's also written for the Eat, Drink, Play section of the East Bay Times and the San Jose Mercury News, and um, is mom. Yes. <laughs> uh, next to her, we have Emily Murphy, and Emily is the author of the best-selling Grow What You Love. She's an organic gardener, photographer, and cook. She studied ethnobotany, environmental science, garden design, and pursues a plant-driven life fueled by inspiration from the simple act of growing. Uh, Emily, too, has a blog, PassThePistol.com, and is the founder of a community gleaning project called Community Ski Squeeze, uh, uh, and has dedicated the last 10 plus years to garden education, uh, teaching and running school gardens. Um, she's appeared on the Today Show, and her work has been in a number of journals, including the Mother Earth News, the North Coast Journal, and Better Homes and Gardens. And in fact, this month's trends issue, uh, you can find her there too. So, um, so cop, and this is her book, so you can <laughs> see. And copies of these are available for sale, and just so you know, um, and you can get them signed, and they're also at a 20% discount from what you'd pay deep retail. So it's a good time and place to buy them here. Um, so anyway, welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. 
so I did not go on too long in the intro, I, I think, because I really, really, both of these women have such an interesting story, and I want to have them tell. Uh, I'm going to ask them each to tell us a little bit more about yourselves, and uh, Basically, how and where you discovered your passion. And uh, Laura, let's go ahead and start with you. And I recall it started when you were a freshman at Berkeley. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, if we're being honest, my passion for food and cooking really started as a kid growing right. up. My mom was from Spain and my dad was Greek. So we grew up eating a lot of kind of plant based Mediterranean food. And so then when I went to college, that was sort of when I woke up to the fact that, like, that's not how. Everyone eats. Um, I gained 30 pounds my freshman year of college because I was basically eating like the self-pour waffles at the dorm and um, pound cake, and you know, just went the other direction. So, um, so that's when I started getting interested in nutrition, and and um, I bounced around majors a bunch of times, but ultimately I studied nutrition at Cal, and kind of simultaneously but separate from studying nutrition, I got really interested in cooking and food. Um, partly because there were so many ethnic restaurants in Berkeley that I hadn't been exposed to growing up. I grew up in Sonoma County, and we have certain ethnic restaurants, but not as many as in Berkeley. And so I, I really loved to eat at those restaurants and then come home and try and reinvent dishes that I had just had out. So I had heard that there was this store, Berkeley Bowl, and um, like, oh, if you like cooking, you have to go there. And so I hopped on the bus, because I didn't have a car in college. And well, first I'm curious, how many people have been to Berkeley Bowl? Oh, yay, good. OK, so I'm preaching to the choir. So hopefully, if you're like me, you remember your first time walking into that store. It's like so overwhelming, partly in a bad way, but mostly in a good way where you just see such immensity of selection and variety, even within a category of fruits and vegetables that's common, like apples. There's like over 40 kinds of apples to choose from. And there's 15 kinds of pineapples, literally. So it's like you're just completely overwhelmed, not to mention some of this stuff that you see where you're like, what on earth is that? So. Um, that first trip, even before I got in the store, I saw these huge bins of, it was September, and I saw all these bins of watermelons and tomatoes and all these beautiful things. And there was a sign saying, yellow watermelon. And I was like, oh, well, I have to try that. So I put it in my cart. And then I saw the tomatoes. And I was like, oh, I'm going to make gazpacho. So I bought you know, five pounds each of tomatoes and um, cucumbers and peppers, put that in my cart. And it wasn't until I went through the checkout stand and Back then, we had plastic bags and had like a 15-pound watermelon and 20 pounds of produce like cutting into my fingers. And I was like, oh, I have to get back to the dorm and on the bus and walk. So it was a bad decision. But from then on, I ended up being the kind of crazy girl that would go to Berkeley Bowl with a giant rolling suitcase, <laughs> the one that we'd go to Spain every summer to visit my grandparents. I would take that and like wheel it around the store and pack that up and wheel that onto the bus. So that's how my relationship started with Berkeley Bowl. But my relationship really changed to that store over the years because like many people, I think most of us have this in common, where when we go to Berkeley Bowl or we go to a farmer's market or to a nursery even and we see um, seeds offerings for things that we don't recognize, like Indian bitter melon or um, shiso, for instance, we like to look at it and kind of go, oh, that's cool. Like I, we're, it's, we're so lucky that we live in the Bay Area and we have access to the stuff. And then we go and we stick with our normal things, right? So in my case, I love to look at these things, but I would always gravitate back to the foods that I grew up eating, the foods of my childhood. So I'd buy my romaine lettuce and my cucumbers and continue on. And that's fine, but I realized with time I was really missing out on something special, and that's what I hope to convey to you tonight. So um, years later, my husband and I, since we didn't, we met freshman year in college and we didn't study abroad, so we made a pact that we would work, save our money, and later in our careers take a sabbatical and go move to Spain and live with my mom's family there. So we did that just five years ago. And while I was there, I did home visit nutrition visits. And I also worked at a municipal market. And it was the kind of market that 
everyone loves to visit in Europe where it has like stalls for the cheese and a stall for the meat and a stall for the produce and it's just like everyone's happy and shopping in their perfect little market. And um, what I loved was seeing all these things come in that I had never seen before. And so my fellow colleague, he um, was this, I don't know, he must have been independently wealthy or something because he worked at a market but lived in this penthouse overlooking the royal palace with his husband. And he, um, he just got a kick out of how excited I was every time I'd see like some intricate crab that I'd never seen before or um, a, a new type of stinky cheese I'd never seen. And so he suggested that we start a cooking club. And so each week on Tuesdays, we would go through and he'd just say, pick what, something that you want to cook with. And so I would choose it, and then he would gather up all these other ingredients, and we'd go back to his house, and we would cook things together. And that's when I awoke to the excitement and also the deeper sense of appreciation that you can have for the bounty that our world offers us in its edible plants and beings as well as like a deeper sense of connection to other cultures and other ways of life, that I missed it when I came home. And so I found myself back in Berkeley, and I went to Berkeley Bowl, and for the first time, I walked through and I actually saw this. Um, it was that season. This is African horn melon, and I was like, I've seen this thing for 15 years at the store, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know what it tastes like, like, why am I not finding out? And so I just picked it up and I put it in my cart with no plan. I took it home, and actually I'll show you what it looks like inside. That's what you get when you cut into it. Even crazier, right? Um, <laughs> I think this looks like a hand grenade from outer space. <laughs> and in fact, my husband's a really big Star Trek fan, and we were, I was like in the room while he was watching it. I don't watch it with him, but I was forced to be in the room. and. Um, the aliens were eating this <laughs> in outer space. So it's like they don't even need to create a fake food for Star Trek. They just use this. So um, I cut into it. I tried it. And I had this like, sense of um, I, I was thrilled because I'm doing something with no plan. And I'm just trying it and deciding what I want to make with it. So I ended up turning it into a cocktail. And I thought, well, that was fun. And so <laughs> I decided. I'm going to do that with every single thing I can find in the store that I've never used before. This is a crazy one, but some of them are things like lemongrass or um, Chinese broccoli. Like they're not everything in everything that you can find is normal to someone somewhere, right? So I wanted to find out why. So I decided to start a blog that was just for me to chronicle like making a recipe for each thing I could find in the store. There's over um, there's like about a hundred ones that were unique to me. And so I started that blog and that's actually what turned into this cookbook. Um, and so this cookbook is sort of a collection of my favorite ways to use my new friends. Things that I didn't know before but that I've grown to love and to learn that um, again, they're as normal to someone else as tomatoes are to me, and so that's probably for a really good reason. So that's how this all came about, and as we continue, I'll be sharing more and kind of showing you and letting you try some of these things. But um, what I hope to convey tonight is really the kind of magic that opens up when you um, kind of let go and just go in confidently and try new things and experiment. Thank you. Um, Emily, tell us your story. Uh, um, first of all, thank you so much again for, for being here and, and sharing this time with us. Um, uh, so my story, uh, my book, Grow What You Love, can you hear me OK? Yeah. My book, Grow What You Love, um, the title, my story comes a little bit from the title of this book. Um, I was very young. I wish I had a single moment. I remember, okay, I'm gonna back up for a minute. I remember reading this book and like, oh, um, I, this is when I was writing my book. I'm like, what did, what did they write in their introduction? Oh, her, her epiphany was, you know, she grew this radish and she forgot it was there and it went to flower and then it created a seed pod and she ate the seed pod and she didn't realize she could eat the seed pod and this whole new world opened up to her. So she's like, I gotta write this book. It's like, oh, I wish, 
I wish it were that simple for me. <laughs> it's just not that simple. Um, not that that's, it's a lovely moment, but um, Grow What You Love really comes from a collection of moments for me, um, starting when I was very young. We all have these moments that form us. And I was very lucky to be surrounded with um, food and growing as a young person. And for me, food and love are the same thing. So in my family, um, everyone calls you sweetie or honey, <laughs> right? You're a sweetie or you're a honey. And, um, and they show their love by making you something wonderful to eat. And usually it's sweet fruit. Uh, most of my family's from Sonoma County. And I would spend my summers um, just all outside the Russian River, very close to where we had those terrible floods a couple uh, weeks ago, uh, with my grandmother, uh, starting when I was about seven. And her answer to everything was love. And if I was fighting with my brother, she'd say, she's Italian, uh, first generation Italian, she'd say, love, 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 right? To keep me from punching him, of course. But, <laughs> And now I know, as an adult, now I know that um, she taught me more about love than just keeping the peace. We would paint together. We would garden together. Uh, we would take walks looking for mushrooms and berries for cooking. And we came home from those walks. And she would clean up the best berries and sprinkle them with sugar and serve them to me. Right? So now I know this is love, too. But then it was only a feeling, because I was just a little kid. But that was the connection. This equals this. Great. I want more of that. And I was raised on this, you know, around this homestead that she had near the Russian River. And my paternal grandfather had a farm. And my parents lived in a college town way up north, Arcata. That's where I grew up, <laughs> Humboldt <laughs> County. But um, my family's from Sonoma County and, and Bay Area. We moved up there later. But it was a really neat dichotomy or uh, triptych in some ways of, of growing because here was, this, here was this massive farm where my grandfather grew these rows of vegetables and um, you know in the, in the cooler months it would be the carrots I'd pull up and in the summer months it would be the lemon cucumbers that I would go out and eat and, and um, later my mom she'd clean them up and slice them into rounds and we'd have these lemon cucumbers that were so simple right but they didn't have to be they didn't have to be complicated to be wonderful because they were fresh from the farm. And my grandmother, she had, she had a completely different setup where it was a small garden and she had her chickens and it was in the middle of a very wild landscape. And then I went home to my neat little city blocks and I realized, you know, we can grow food here too. It just looks a little different and you can find the same things. You just have to know where to look, kind of like going to the Berkeley Bowl. And so over time, I realized, oh, I have all these people in my life growing things. We had a garden. And then later, my fifth grade teacher, she also had a little homestead in, in Arcata. And, um, and that's where I think I did my first fish emulsion with real fish. Uh, and, and we had rabbits and berries. And, and all of those moments, all those food moments, right, growing moments came together. And later, I studied botany because I had this you know, deep infatuation with, <coughs> with growing things and realized, of course, that growing things is the step before the kitchen. And that when we, these plants that I'm growing, that I had this collection of plants, sort of like Laura, where you grow up with these plants, whether they're food plants that you're, you're used to eating and cooking with in the kitchen or plants that you grow. And those are the things you're comfortable with. And, and um, over time, I realized, you know, I could take the information, the knowledge I have of these plants and, uh, and grow something new. And um, so in, in that sense, right, plants aren't so different from people, right? They have their own likes and dislikes and, and quirky habits. And, um, and we, can, we can ask them, just like people, when you meet someone, you say, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, where are you from? And that immediately get a, a picture in your head when, when I say, oh, I grew up in Arcata. Right? Any of you knows that or know where that is? Or I grew up in Alaska, or I grew up in Italy. Your picture is very different. And, and then what do you do? It's the same thing with plants. Where are you from? Uh, are you an annual? Are you a perennial? And you can take right, and you can take that knowledge and translate it into growing new plants. I'm like, well, I'm going to grow some new plants. And and so that that grew into my blog, Past the Pistol. Um, I realized that I had that I needed to get back to plants at some point because I was doing, spending a lot of time with teaching. 
and the blog, as, as Laura mentioned, transformed into, into the book, but it was past the pistol, which was, um, I can't give you the whole, the whole, it used to be shooter past the pistol, which was short for basically um, get to it and do it right, and why are you wait, why, why are you waiting? Um, and then I realized, wait, what am I really trying to say? And well, grow what you love and pass it on, right? Because that's what I had been given. Do these things, grow these things. Sweetie, honey, will you grow for me? And here's how you do it, and, and here you go. And um, so that message, you'll see in the back that it's, um, there's a little note to my grandmother, and there's a note about her in the beginning that it all started with that moment, if that makes sense. But, uh, and then I found myself here many years, many years later. It took me a while to get here. You know those maps of like the A to B, right? And this is the shortest route, but mine's like this. <laughs> so there's a lot of stories in the book. That helps, but um, we can go into more later. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, and I think, I, let me just say, it's a perfect segue into the next thing I was going to ask you. And I think we'll start with Laura again this time because as we all know, the creative process uh, is ex experimenting. Sometimes things work out better than other times. Uh, and so why don't you talk about some of your, maybe an unexpected success and maybe a surprise and maybe, maybe a failure? Because things don't always come out perfectly, do they? No, there are plenty okay. of those. <laughs> OK. And at the same time, you maybe can show off some of the cool yeah. stuff you've got here. OK. Um, OK, so yeah, I think. One of the fun things that you'll find when you start to take new things home that you're not comfortable with is there's oftentimes surprises that happen. And sometimes they're really awful, but sometimes they're really great. And actually, the shiso limeade that you had tonight was a perfect example of one of the kind of magical surprises that can happen when you're experimenting in the kitchen. And I actually saved, I'll show you. So, so and actually, this is a good chance to kind of walk you through my process in case that helps you develop your own process with how to work with these things. But basically, I would take home a new thing. First, I would go stand in the store for like three hours at a time and just <laughs> look like I was staring into space, like I would just fixate. But really, I was seeing what was there and I was like thinking through what I could possibly do with it. I, I swear, that store must think I'm so crazy. But uh, so this is Shiso. Unfortunately, it wilted on my drive, my 55 minute drive from. Oakland, like eight miles away. Um, but this is Chinese shiso, and it's heart-shaped. Here, I'll pick one off. Kind of heart-shaped leaves, and they're green on this side and purple on that side. And so I decided, OK, this is what I'm going to take home. And so what I usually did when I'd come home is I would just kind of download all the sensory outputs I could get from an item. So I would try it raw, try it cooked, evaluate the flavor. Like, is this something that I, um, a flavor that would be covered up if I combine it with something too strong? Is this something so powerful that I want to find a way to dilute it a little? Is it musky, in which case I want to brighten it? Is it really acidic, in which case maybe I'll combine it with mushrooms or something mellow? So I would experiment with its flavor and then also look at other properties. Like, is there a color I want to really exploit? Is there a texture that I want to make sure I bring out and I don't destroy in cooking, or a texture that I want to change through cooking. Um, so it, is there a fragrance, like a beaut, for instance, quince? I don't know if you've ever smelled quince, but to me, it's the most intoxicating fragrance. And so it's like you want to prepare it in a way that brings that out, right? So in the case of shiso, I tried it as a leaf, and it's very pungent. It's kind of like an herb or a, um, a tea. And so I knew I didn't want to cook with it as a whole leaf. And I also didn't want to just slice it up and sprinkle it on a salad, because that's a cop out. That's not really like honoring the vegetable as the hero of the dish. So I thought, OK, I'm going to make a tea out of it, because it, that has this really like minty, lemony scent, but with a musky, earthy undertone that I thought, this is going to be a really good tea. So I brewed it. And it comes out like this, like pretty clear. Um, and I tried it, and I wasn't sure what, I, what direction I was going to go. Am I going to use it in a cocktail? Am I going to have it warm? Am I going to have it cold? But after I tried it, I thought, OK, this needs something bright. Like, it is a little earthy. 
um, kind of like a green tea. And so I thought, I have some limes. Let's go cold root, and I'll make it. I'll sweeten it with some agave nectar, and I'll put some lime juice in it. So when I did that, you already know the punchline because you just drank it and you saw what color it is. But like this is how quickly it happens. <laughs> so just like changes in front of your eyes, and I had no idea it's until like a I did it. Yeah, it was it's like so, Harry Potter. It was. It was seriously like I felt like a wizard, and so I'm like hollering in the kitchen. And my husband comes running in, and I was like, look it, it's pink. And he like he doesn't know that it wasn't pink. So it's kind of like, yeah, like it's beet juice. Or and I was like, no, but like a second ago it was clear. And you know, it was just this really exciting moment in the kitchen. And this type of thing happened all the time because I, I wasn't familiar with these things. Maybe a lot of people know that about Chiso. But um, it, it, it's just like one of the... This is probably the, qu the quintessential surprise that happened to me. And I think of how many more are waiting out there. So that's one of the good ones. Um, let's see. So I brought something else to show you. So you said a surprise, a failure, and a, a success. A I success. think this okay. qualifies as both a success and a surprise. But you Well, actually, this one. is the, my success. So okay. does anyone know what this is? Yes, good. So this is Indian bitter melon. There's a couple kinds of bitter melon. But this one that's kind of spiky is Indian. And um, to me, this is the recipe I was most proud of because it was the most challenging for me. Um, if you've ever tried this, it's, it's not bitter like, oh, I like bitter, I like coffee. It's not like that. To me, it tastes like uh, kind of like crushed up aspirin. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought, how am I going to make this palatable? And I tried all these different ways to do it, and I just couldn't get myself to eat it. And I'm like, how am I going to get this in this book? But I knew I really wanted it in the book because as a dietitian, these are in incredibly healthy for you. Very anti-cancer. Um, they help lower blood sugar. It, in fact, it's being researched a lot for its medicinal qualities. So I knew I wanted to include it in the book. Um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to as I'm talking, I'm going to slice this and pass it around in case you want to try a little piece by itself so that you know exactly how bitter it is. Um, so what I did first was I combined it with, I, I was like, oh, I need to cover up this bitterness. I'm going to make a curry. And so I put every spice I could think of in there. And <laughs> I still couldn't eat it. And then um, I was like, well, maybe I need to go the Thai route and cover it up with coconut milk and fat. So then I added coconut milk to the curry, and that like made it worse. It like leached out this, <laughs> the taste even more. So um, I took a step back, and I was like, you know, this is bitter for a reason, and I need to exploit its bitterness rather than try and cover it up, because there's no way to cover it up. So I thought of something medicinal and bitter that we tend to like which is tonic water, right? Like a gin tonic. So it has qu that quinine. Oh, yeah, I love that. Um, <laughs> it has that quinine um, in it that makes it kind of medicinal. And so, here, I'll pass that around. So I put that in a pot. I chopped it up. I put it in a pot, and I brewed it with grapefruit and lemon and juniper berries. And it... I'm just so proud of this recipe because it's good. It's like it's better than store-bought tonic, and you add club soda to it and add gin, and it's just it's amazing. And I know I've talked about two drinks, but they're not all drinks in the book. Those are the only drinks, actually. Um, but yeah, that was one of the ones I felt like I got that in the book, and I love the recipe. So, um, and then a failure. A failure would be um, there are lots, but one. The biggest learning experience failure was um, I, there's these beautiful taro leaves. Have you seen a taro leaf before? Even in Hawaii, yeah, exactly, you're going like this. It's also called elephant ear plant, so they're, they can be like this big. And they're beautiful and velvety, and they're used in kind of Pacific Island cultures. A lot of my Tongan patients use taro. But I, I never wanted to use um, ingredients the way they were used in their culture, like I don't want to just steal a recipe, so I always wanted to create my own recipe. And so I thought, I'm going to make a giant dolma, because since my dad was Greek, <laughs> I was like, what if I stuff this and it will just be this beautiful green dolma? 
So I had all these ideas, and I stuffed it with a, like rice and mushroom, mushroom mixture and tomatoes, and I put it in a big pot, and I simmered it with like a coconut lemongrass um, broth. And my husband and I sat down to eat it, and um, <laughs> he has a peanut allergy. And so after a couple bites, he was like, is there peanut in this? And I said, no. And then I noticed my mouth was feeling like I had just eaten glass. Like it was, it was, uh, felt like it was cut up. And he said, I feel like my throat's closing up. And so I rushed to my laptop and I read about taro. And it turns out it's, it has a lot of oxalic acid in it, which are like little tiny fiberglass crystals. And they're destroyed once you cook it long enough, which apparently is like a 45 minute mark of boiling. And I did mine for like 35 minutes. And so there was enough left that we, we had a reaction. And it can be apparently deadly, but our throats like got themselves under control and we survived, because here I am. Um, but I learned in that experience that part of what I loved about this process was going in completely blind and not doing a lot of prior research because I didn't want to be stuck thinking about a food in one context. Um, so I like to just take it home and try it and come up with my own thing. But I learned you should at least look up the toxicology before <laughs> you experiment. So that's what I would recommend doing is, you know, before you try something completely new. And actually, in my book, for each item, I have a sidebar, and it has safety. And so it will say, like, don't touch this without gloves. Or um, you need to oil your hands because it gets, like, sticky on it and you can't get it off. Or don't eat this raw because you will die. So I put that in there. But um, you could always do a Google search. And a website that I found really helpful is called um, specialtyproduce.com. And they have just kind of the ethnographical information and safety and seasonal information that's really helpful without like a ton of recipes to lead you down one road. So yeah. And I'll show more of these later. We'll do kind of name that item. Yeah. As we go. So. <laughs> oh, Emily, what, what about you? And I don't know if you want if you've got any samples of part of this, but do you have? I some have a I have a demonstration. So. I don't have a sample of like of vegetables. I have a demonstration I'm going to do in a little bit. Okay. Um, my samples are those candy violet cookies back there. Um, thank you, thank you. I think I'm going to start with um, the surprise and the failure first. Um, so this this long process that I was describing earlier, I came to realize that. Um, over the years of growing things and trial and error, uh, that the, what we cultivate in our gardens, we cultivate in ourselves. So food with purpose, play, diversity, richness in living, beauty, of course, and, and the things we love. And in our gardens, we learn to see. And uh, especially when we consider, uh, say, pairing edible flowers w and companion plants with vegetables, for instance. And so I've been developing these things over time, right? Like, okay, I get this. I'm, I'm growing my family. I'm growing, I'm growing my life. I'm growing my health. And we have all these wonderful things to eat. And we have these moments in the garden. Um, and uh, I have this prior knowledge. And I, I'm in the school garden with the kids. And... Um, I, this is, this is sort of my failure and my surprise wrapped up in one. Um, this, the students and I, we are preparing for an event called Salad Days. And Salad Days, there's about 650 students in the school. And Salad Days, uh, we serve salad to the entire school that's grown in the garden. Wow. And, which is really, really cool. And I'm so happy to be a part of this because I know that what we're cultivating in the garden is more than just salad, right? We're, I'm helping these children, and I, f I feel so passionately about that. That's where things begin, and that's where we, we start to become healthy adults. Um, and I'm gung-ho, and this is my daughter's school. I get to be a part of her education, and, um, and everything goes really well. So salad days, the kindergartners are planting the lettuce seeds, which is great, right? Because they're part of the process from the very beginning. And we plant them in paper pots like these because uh, they're so much fun to make. So the engagement starts here with the actually making paper pot. And they plant their seeds, and the seeds go in the greenhouse because it's a little bit cool still. It's like February, March, because we have to serve the salad by May. And everything's great until the lettuces get, go to get planted out in the garden. That's when things get really interesting. 
And um, so backing up, it's helpful to know, I'll let you in on a little secret, that um, I'm a Virgo. And if any, of, <laughs> if, any of, if any of you here in this group are, are Virgos, you know a Virgo in your life, um, it could be that my qualities you might recognize in your, yourself or your friends where, you know, you like things to be kind of neat and tidy in some parts of your life and you kind of go by the book, certain things, and then you know, there might be a pile or two over here and there's a little bit of chaos. Well, that's, that's kind of my life. And when it comes to my uh, fruits and, or my veggies in particular, especially lettuces, you compare them in the garden and they can be so beautiful. You know, if you compare greens, you compare reds, and you can make, you can plant the chard down the middle of the bed with the rainbow colors, and on the side you can grow, you know, something shorter like mizuna, and it's really beautiful. Or you can grow, if you really want to save on space, you can plant in stars or triangle patterns instead of rows, and that can be really beautiful. And my Virgo self really likes those colors. It's so satisfying. Well, the kindergartners go to plant their lettuces, which they had grown so carefully, out to the garden, and there was nothing neat and tidy about it. It was one plant here, one plant there, scatter shot for the win. I had to kind of breathe, I had to rejigger myself. My, my adult Virgo self had to come to grips with the fact that, yes, it would be, there wouldn't be nothing neat and tidy about it. And, um, you know what, it was absolutely terrific. Uh, the, what the children had created was a slice of life. And they created room for interplanting. So we could plant herbs and edible flowers between the lettuces. And in the process, some of the work of caring for those lettuces was done for us, right? Because when you plant in nice big swaths of, of the same plant, it can be really beautiful. but then it makes it easier for pests and other creatures that want to eat those plants to come in and find them. And um, the herbs and the fragrances of the herbs and the flowers, they, they, not only was it gorgeous and it's wild, right? That's the other part of my Virgo self, that wild sort of way. But um, it was really the easiest garden to take care of because it was all mix and match everywhere. And I think that was one of my, my best surprises was, um, was this moment. And, I realized, too, in that moment, there's this quote, and it's, I think it's a modified quote. It goes something like this. It's, if you always do what you've always done, then you always get what you've always got. It's like Henry Ford or Einstein or someone, but I'm sure it sounded much better than that. And, and you know what? In some instances, that's great. If, if whatever you're doing works and it's, you, you're finding success, like you grow your tomatoes a certain way and you always get a bumper crop of tomatoes, don't stop doing that. Don't, right? Keep doing that, whatever it is. Um, but in other instances, mixing things up leaves room for discovery and um, opportunities to experiment and cultivate new things in your life, which is really wonderful and really simple because these moments, these everyday moments, this is life. This is it. And how can we make that, you know, that much more interesting and better? Um, and I think along with that then, my, my failure at that point was I realized that, that I should have been doing that all along. Like, okay, I studied ecology. Now why, why, okay, but I had this idea, right, of what was beautiful and what was right. And I think that, um, you know, I trust myself, right? I, I had these, all these people in my life showing me what to do. I never, I never doubted my ability to plant a seed and help it grow. But it was, it was how I was doing that, that that I needed to question. That maybe the way I'd always been doing it was fine, but it could have been better. And um, so I think in some ways, trusting myself, yes, but not trusting myself to, and giving myself room to try things from the very beginning um, was probably one of my biggest failures. And I think, that, I think that for many of us, growing things, like it can be really scary to grow something. Like for most of us, I'm, I'm one of those lucky people that had this chance to trial, for trial and error as a very young person with growing at least the basic parts of growing. Um, and for many of us, we're afraid to plant anything for fear of growing it. The one thing we're trying to do is grow this plant. And I can guarantee you that plants were killed in the making of my book. So even though I have this confidence of growing, I still kill things all the time. Um, but really, I think my failure was, you know, backing up, just trying things sooner, being willing to experiment 
sooner in my life. But, it, you know, but everything has its time, too, right? I didn't have that epiphany until I had this experience in the garden. And um, success. Um, I keep that shorter because I know I've kind of gone on about that. The, key, the students are just so cute to watch them plant things. I could talk about them all day. Um, success. Uh, or just maybe talk about what you've got growing right now or what you're yeah, excited oh, about this spring. I know. Yes. So one of the things I'm really excited to grow this, this and this, one of these plants is in the book and one of these plants isn't. Um, so the book features 12 sets of seasonal ingredients. The idea is to change your life and your cooking. These are the gardener's choice and the chef's choice of plants. They are easy to grow. They're packed with flavor. Uh, and you really get a lot of bang for your buck. Either they're plants you don't often find at the market, such as you know thyme with its flowers, because you can eat the flowers just as easily as you can eat the leaves. How wonderful is that? Um, nasturtiums, right? They, you know, they grow pretty readily in our gardens, especially closer to the coast. Um, these are plants that we can grow at home very easily. Uh, but again, you won't find them at the market or they're packed with flavor. And so there are the, there's this curated group of plants in the book. But one of the plants that's not in the book, I didn't put in the book, is uh, sugar or watermelons. And sh sugar baby watermelons is something I just grew for the first time with great success this last year because I've always lived in a compromised climate. So I've always either lived in Humboldt, mile from the ocean, not enough heat, or the mountains. I, I lived for years up by Lake Tahoe. Short growing season, way too short for melons. Or now I'm living by the coast again. But I have this community garden plot that you'll see in the book. There's three gardens in the book because I'm renting. So I, it's like anywhere that I can grow, I'll, I'll plant something. But um, this community garden plot's inland just by a little bit. More like your climate, you can grow everything here. Um, like I'm going to try growing sugar baby watermelons because at least I know I'll have maybe an, I'll maybe have enough growing season for them, and I was, I'm just going to throw them in under these sunflowers. Let me just see what happens because the sunflowers, they're the giant mammoth, the Russian mammoths. They're going to get really tall, and by the time they get tall, that's when the melons are going to start to mature, and so they won't shade them out. And wouldn't that be a great way to cover ground, reduce weeds? Um, Right, and they're beautiful. The leaves of melons are so gorgeous. And, and I'd have something to eat. That would be amazing. And if I don't, that's OK, because I'm covering ground below these, below these sunflowers that I want to grow, because I can't imagine a garden without sunflowers. And you know what? I got 10 melons off of two plants, which was amazing. So that's one of my successes. And again, it goes back to you know, trying things. Like, I'm just going to try it. Every year, I just grow something, I grow something new. And this year and last year, I didn't do that. So you, if you always do, you always done, you always get, you always got. I didn't do that, and I had that success, but I, I don't have a lot of space, so I was like, I'm gonna try something new. This year, I'm going back to about a four by four space of sunflowers and sugar baby melons, because they brought on my family so much joy, <laughs> and they're so beautiful. Great. Um, Laura, why don't you um, go through some of the, the interesting things you've got there in your, in your basket? Okay. Um, and I should mention, so I bought some of the kind of crazier things, but um, as you saw in the samples, rhubarb, vanilla jam, and pickled kumquats. The reason I chose those is because they're things that you can get anywhere. You can get it at the, the Whole Foods in Lafayette. Um, you don't have to go to Berkeley Bowl to get it. And that's the case for a lot of these things. And so um, I've actually gotten a lot of joy out of having readers um, in Montreal and New Zealand and like small towns in Texas tell me that they've really enjoyed kind of using this as a treasure map to go out to ethnic groceries and farmers markets to look for these things because everything will be in some ethnic grocery it's just the unique thing about Berkeley Bowl is it's all under one roof you go to one place and you can get it all but you can find them elsewhere so um one thing I want to make sure I pass around to you all is sea beans has anyone had a sea bean before? Yes. I've never had a talk where someone has, so thank you. Thank you. I, I'm not connected to anything, so I can bring so, this um, over. These are, this was probably my new favorite friend in the process of making this book, and I use these more than anything I have in the book. And that's because I just think they're delightful. Sea beans, so S-E-A-B-E-A-N-S. -E -E they're also called, called glasswort. Or pickleweed or salicornia. Yes, it has a lot of different names. 
but it's a saltwater, it's an aquatic succulent. It grows oh. in saltwater marshes right on our own coastline. You could also grow it in yeah, we, the garden. Yeah, we have, it grows along the bay. You just want yeah. to be careful where you're picking it from, right? Yes. But I feel like you can grow it in I your I would grow it in your make, garden yeah. and make it, yeah, in your rain garden. Exactly. <laughs> but these are, so these are warm because they've been out, but when they're cold, they are like a, biting into a crispy piece of aloe where it just kind of shoots salt water in your mouth. So I love putting these on salads or the, the recipe I have in the book, it's with soba noodles, um, like a soba noodle salad because soba is very silky and then these are like really crispy. So that's something I wanted to make sure you tried. Um, this is the rhubarb that's in the jam, and it's like the reddest rhubarb I've ever seen, really red. which is why the jam is fuchsia, but I just thought that was really pretty. Um, I'll pass these around, too. Does anyone know what these are? Good guess. Not fava. Fava come in long pods. These are garbanzos. They're just chickpeas. So again, these aren't... I don't call this a book of exotic vegetables because it's not. It's just vegetables and fruits that we don't tend to utilize as often. And a lot of times that's just because grocery stores don't carry them. Just like we've been talking about, we've, we have a curated picture of what we should be eating. And that's usually determined by the bottom line of mega grocery stores. And that's what can travel well, what do we have enough of that can fill a centralized warehouse and get shipped out to all the sites. So you're not going to see fiddleheads and garbanzo beans like this at grocery stores. So that's why this project was so cool to see like, oh, this is what a garbanzo bean looks like. And I'll pass these around so you can try them. They're, um, they're green and they're really fresh tasting. And so I like to eat these raw. You don't even have to cook them. Um, this, I don't think, well, if you want to come try this afterwards, you can come up. And if you want a reason to come try it, um, <laughs> Mark Twain was quoted as saying, this is the most delicious fruit known to man. It's called a cherry moya. It's from the Andes, but we have um, a similar climate to certain regions of the Andes, so the, you can get California-grown cherry moya. So that's another thing I love about living here is even the exotics are oftentimes grown here, like passion fruit or cherry moya. <coughs> this name? Cherry Moya. It, it's also called Chiri Moya, depending on what region you're coming from. So C-H-E-R-I-M-O-Y-A. And it's, um, it's also called custard apple, because when you slice into it, it's like a velvety white custard that kind of tastes like banana and apple. So this is made into a velvety panna cotta in the book. Awesome. Um, it comes from the Andes, the Andes region, so Peru, Ecuador. You guys probably recognize this from your Lafayette Art. Reservoir walks. <laughs> <laughs> so you can eat these. And when I, um, before my mom passed, she used to love to go to the reservoir. And so we'd go, and she tried these for the first time in testing for my cookbook. And because uh, she didn't grow up eating these in Spain, this is more popular in Latin America. And after she tried these, she became obsessed. And so she'd be like, can we go to the reservoir? And I'd be like, yeah. And I'm getting in the car. And I'd see her like, delay and come out with like, a big paper bag and, and uh, rubber gloves and <laughs> a knife. And I'm like, you just want to cut uh, nopales again, right? Yeah. <laughs> so these are called nopales or prickly pear cactus. And the fruit that sits on top is also a recipe in the book because that's amazing as well. And you had a question. Oh, I should have said that. Yes. Oh, sorry. People are eating the paper. Yes. You want to open the paper and take the pee out. <laughs> and there will be time for questions from the audience when we're, when we're done. That way people that will be able to hear what you're asking. Point, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last one I'll pass around is this one. Buddha's hand. Great. So this is called Buddha's hand. It's a type of citron. Like you might have seen citron circular. Um, but these are used in, in Asian countries as air fresheners, just kept in a bowl in the room. And this is sort of like quince, where it has, it's not just a citrus scent, it's like a perfume scent. So I'll rip off a couple fingers and you can smell it. But in terms of like the process I was talking about earlier, it's like when you smell this, you're like, I don't want to mess this up. So um, <laughs> what can you do with this that really highlights the fact that the whole pith is edible, 
and it has a really fragrant scent. So what I did with it was chopped it up fine and it's just folded into a scone. Something simple where you really taste this. Um, but people just throw, throw it in a glass of water with, um, with hot water to make a tea or you can make marmalade out of it because it's, it's unlike other citrus fruits, the rind and the pith aren't bitter. So you can eat the whole thing. You candy it too. Like you candy yes. lemon peel. It's so good. It's so good. And I'm going to cut this open too so you can see it. This is one of the exotics dragon fruit. And I just love the contrast of the inside. Oh, cool. So pretty. Um, and so this is like sliced thinly on a lime curd tart. I'm only talking about desserts and drinks today, but I swear there's <laughs> like food in here too. Thank you. So I'll pass some of these out. And while she's doing that, Emily, why don't you talk a little bit about how, how you do your little seed? Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Oh, no. Okay. I want to um, make sure you have time. So Lisa had asked, okay, well, what can you bring to, to demonstrate? It's like, well, I can't bring the whole garden. Um, but I brought paper pots for planting seeds. And I wanted to show this to you. I know I mentioned these, um, something I do with students. This is something I do at home. This is great for a home garden that's a small garden if you want to skip plastic. And what I like to, what I, an activity I like to do with these, with um, especially with kids, but even with, with all of you, is to remind us that our gardens don't have to be complicated. They can be really simple. And you don't really need much to start a garden, right? You just need seed and soil and a place to plant your seed. So if it holds soil and allows for drainage, it can be a garden. And your gardens can start here. So paper pots, they're newspaper. Newspaper is biodegradable. It's made with uh, vegetable uh, dye, right? And so if I were to plant this now, because this is pretty mature, there's a little bit of root coming out, I'd probably peel this off a little bit and then pop it in the ground. Uh, you can put the whole thing in the ground like this. Um, it's great for cheating. And isn't this the perfect gift? Yeah. yeah. Like, Oh, and I and I and I realized how this is a perfect gift. Again, I I, I had these um, I had a tray like this, and they were filled with sunflower starts. And I was walking down the street, and I swear I think I was accosted about ten times. Like, <laughs> what are those? Oh my goodness! Can I have one? And I was like, yes. And you know what? Because they're the perfect gift. You can just take one with you. And I spent no money to do that, and and they travel so nicely. Um, so to make paper pots. You can buy a kit at your, you know, through Gardener Supply magazine or um, maybe at your garden center for making paper pots. But really all you need is newspaper and a tool like this. This is a can. This is a tomato paste can. One end is closed. One end is open. So um, I know for me when I'm using tomato paste in the kitchen from a can, I'll cut on you know, I'll open both ends and kind of just push it through instead of scooping it out. So um, refrain from doing that. Keep that one end closed. Um, this is basically a quarter sheet of a newspaper, right? So if it's a half of the half of the page. And you just roll the paper around the can. And you roll loosely because there's this lip. I'll show you why in a minute. And kind of loose. And if you feel like it's too tight, you can kind of shake it like that. Oops. And then hold it here at the seam. This is I like to hold it at the seam because I've discovered then I only need three pushes. One, two, three. And you take the can out. It's a little bit tight. Oh. Put it back in, and it pushes the folds together. And then you, can, then you can take soil, fill it with soil like this. And I put it in a tray like this, and you can take a seed. So I brought, these are seeds from, these are basically the same plant, right? Uh, from snap peas. These are snap pea seeds, and um, one of these might be a snow pea. And, and pop your seed in there. And you know, with something like peas, I usually just put one seed in, but if it's, um, you know, when you're planting two or three seeds, uh, and then clip off the, the less vigorous seedlings when they pop up, you have one, then you have one plant per pot, which is ideal, because you're not transplanting them out from the pot, you're taking the pot and putting it in the garden. But there's your garden. And I've been growing these. I'm lucky enough to have a big south-facing window. Uh, if you don't have much light, then you would need a grow light or a place to start them outside. We are lucky enough that we can really put them outdoors during the day because it's not that cold. I was just in Philadelphia and Toronto, and I can guarantee you that oh they, need, they need an indoor grow system. 
But this is paper pots for planting seeds, and it's a, it's a very engaging activity um, if you're working with children, and it's a really fun activity if you just want to get together and have like part of your book club. Let's make paper pots, and then we're going to give seeds away, because I have all these sunflower seeds from last year's garden, and then you can take them all home or give them to whomever. And um, it's really a lot of fun. So that's paper pots. This is how your garden starts, really simple, not complicated. Grow two or three things, and you're on your way. Grow one thing, and you're on your way to growing something. Okay, great. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, th th clearly there's a lot of people in this room that know a lot about this al some of these subjects already. So, uh, but I thought we'd leave a little time for questions. So, is there anybody from the audience with a question? Well, Okay. Well, I'll start with I'll start with this one, and then I'll just the, you can just ask, and I'll repeat it so we, we can hear it. So, shiso is it only lime lime uh, juice, or will lemon also turn it pink? Any I don't know who I'm looking at because I don't know who. Okay. <laughs> so any acid will work. Um, so what's happening there is anthocyanin is a phytonutrient, so a nutrient that we get from plants that's not a vitamin or a mineral, but it still has benefit. So in this case, anthocyanin is actually a pigment, and it's the same pigment that turns any plant blue, pink. So blueberries and purple cabbage. Or, yeah, or rhubarb. rhubarb. Yeah. So um, when you make that infusion, that pigment is in there, but it's not active until it's in an acidic environment. And so that's what is happening is when you add an acid, like you could add vinegar, although that wouldn't taste good, um, and it activates that pigment. And it, it, that pigment, anthocyanin, along with all pigments really, like chlorophyll and beta carotene, is really healthy for you. And that's why, um, you know, in my, with my nutrition patients, we always say eat the rainbow because every pigment has different properties, right? We know beta carotene for eyes, but each one does something different. And so that's why it is really important to branch away from carrots and peas and get some other colors into your diet. But we all know that in California, so. <laughs> okay, um, another question. If it wasn't obvious, yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes okay. it's obvious. I mean, that one is obvious. Oh, sorry. That's yeah. okay. I just want to repeat the question so everybody can hear it. Um, so, so, see if I can remember it now. Um, so, uh, how do you know what part of the vegetable to actually is the part you can eat? If I'm not doing research, okay. So, um, I I should say I wasn't doing online research, but I think one of the joys about doing this sort of shopping and cooking and growing is, um, like I said in the beginning, it's a chance to really deepen connection with others. And so what I found in doing this project is I would kind of camp out where this item was in the grocery store or in the farmer's market and wait till someone picked it up. <laughs> and I'd be like, what do you do with that? And sometimes, you know, I could tell I was shocking someone that I would be holding like a large burdock root or gobo used in Japanese culture, and I'd be like holding it there, and they're like, what are you doing with that? <laughs> um, but it was a chance to talk to people and really see what, what this is used for, but without like really seeing a recipe and feeling like I'm stuck in that. So I loved that opportunity to talk with people or to talk to the grower at the farmer's market. Like, oh, what is this? Um, like, what, what did I just see there? I saw like a... It wasn't at the farmer's market. Yeah, I saw something. Oh, well, actually, they have, they have Armenian cucumbers, these really curly cucumbers. They have squash blossoms. They have all sorts of things that you can find in the book. And so I love talking to the farmers, like, what do you recommend to do with this? Or the person at the checkout counter, like one of the, um, one of the prettiest things in here, I think, is, is this, which is banana blossom. It's really pretty. And it's, it's like this big. And so I bought it, and the checkout, the girl at the checkout counter happened to be Indonesian. And she was like, what are you buying that for? And I was like, I don't know. Uh, what do you think? And she's like, oh, my mom makes this all the time. And so she told me how they do it. They like stew it in coconut milk, which is not the direction I went. But um, yeah, it's, so I would pick it up by talking to people. And if it was really confusing, I would, I, you could look it up. I just meant I don't like to spend a lot of time researching recipes because 
again, it's sort of like how we treat eggplant. You know, it's like we think of eggplant as eggplant parm, and it's always used in, in um, kind of like Italian-style dishes. And it's like, well, what if we think of eggplant as something else? Like, if we didn't have that background, what would that open up in possibilities of what we could do with eggplant? So, mm -hmm. uh, in the front here. So the question was, when did you travel in Spain, and sort of what, 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 what were the what influences there that you brought back? Um, well, so my mom, she was from Madrid, and so she came over for college, but all her family stayed. So my aunts and uncles and grandparents all lived there. And so um, when I decided to live abroad, I knew I wanted to go live in the home where she grew up, because that's where her family still lives. So that's where we were, and actually, kind of, Lisa knows the background, but a kind of special part of this is my mom ended up ret knowing that my husband and I were going, she's like, well, I'm not missing out on <laughs> living in Spain with you. Like, you're going to go live in my country without me? And so she retired that year, and she came with us. And then, like I mentioned, she actually passed away last year really unexpectedly. So we got this whole year like, being retired together, which was really special. But um, in terms of and of course, we traveled around all of Spain, because Spain is a really um, gastronomically diverse country. It's not just paella and gazpacho. It has, the north is more like what we eat in California, like greens and roasted leeks. And it's just like beautiful produce. Um, and so I, more than any given dish, because I already grew up eating Spanish food from my mom, I brought back that sense of adventurous cooking that I had gotten from living there. And you know when you're on vacation and you do things that you wouldn't do at home, right? <laughs> like you stay out later, you eat something that you wouldn't eat at home, or you go dancing and you never dance at home. It's like that was sort of the spirit that I was living in there. And when I got home, it was like, wait, we can, be, we can live adventurously in our own backyard. You don't have to be abroad to do that. And so that's, that's like the main thing I brought home. But You'll notice a, a lot of the recipes are rooted in Spanish cooking. Like there's a tortilla de patatas, which is like, I think it's called Spanish tortilla here, right? That's, um, there's a take on that. And there's a, a beautiful, one of my favorite dishes growing up was sopa de ajo, which is like a simple garlic soup. So you just slice garlic and you saute it. You kind of fry it lightly in pimenton, which is a type of paprika. And then you just add stock, crusty bread, and crack an egg into it. So it's a really ugly soup, but it's really good and comforting. It's kind of like peasant food. And um, there's a vegetable, it kind of looks like this, called bakha, which is the stalk of the elephant ear plant. So same taro, but it's the stalk of it. And inside, it's this like white, spongy root that soaks up broth. And I was like, what a great addition to this soup. Like instead of the bread, you put this, um, this spongy stock that soaks up all that garlicky juice, and it adds it, it makes it a little lighter so it's not so heavy with bread and egg. So it's like there's a lot of Spanish influence in the book because I took things that I knew growing up and I incorporated these new ingredients. And so really what I'm hoping people get out of the book is the confidence to maybe know that they have a place to start. Like I'm going to bring this home and I have at least something, some idea of what to do with it. But really, that just introduces you to the food, and then you can incorporate it in your own ways of cooking. Dishes that you grew up eating, you might say, oh, that would be a really good replacement for cucumber, or a really good replacement for tomatoes. So that's sort of the idea. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I yeah. can say nothing about soil, so I'm going to defer to Emily. <laughs> so the, the question is basically, how do you how do you grow things in this walnut creek clay? Yeah. Or what do you what? Yeah. Um, I would I highly recommend starting with boxes or beds, raised beds, because then you can focus your attention and just tend to that soil. Um, it's not to say you can't grow in the ground, um, but if you have issues with gophers and other animals, it just it gives them fewer opportunities to. Um, come and consume the garden you're trying to grow. Um, but soil, again, so, so <coughs> clay, right? There are ways to amend clay. And the number one recommendation is, is compost. 
and, and adding compost to, to clay soils. Uh, and then you could also grow something like fava beans or broad beans in that clay soil because the roots are really strong and, they're, and they're, they do a great job of imp improving soil tilth and they add nitrogen to the soil. And you can um, let them grow to flower and, and you have the broad beans, you have the fava beans to eat. Or um, if you really want to add more nitrogen to the soil, you cut them down um, right before they flower. That's when they have the most nitrogen um, associated with the root system. And then put that, those fava beans back into the soil. But really starting with uh, an organic soil in your, in your boxes or your beds. So um, you can start with a planting mix depending upon how big they are. The smaller they get, the, the more you're going to want to go towards um, a potting mix. Uh, and try to find a peat-free potting mix if you could. So some peat-free, right? Because peat, peat moss isn't sustainable. It takes about 100 years or more for a peat bog to, to develop. And more and more now we're able to find soils that are instead have coconut core in them, which is much more sustainable. It's a byproduct of the coconut industry. And it's pH neutral and it does the same, behaves the same way in say a potting mix. Um, and really tend the soil like you're tending a life system. Because what happens below ground happens above ground. And the, the, the health of your plants is really a, a reflection of the health of the root system and the soil. And you're cultivating that soil food web, which is just as important as the, as the, as the life above ground. So wildlife, right, supporting pollinators and insects and animals of all kinds. And if you grow your garden organically and you add companion plants, you can do that, and you can do that for the soil and above ground. That's a whole other conversation, but um, I think that's really important, considering what's happening with, say, monarch butterflies, and especially our Western population, is to grow organic. Um, and I can talk to you about that later if you're curious, because I did just get off the phone with the Xerces Society about two or three weeks ago before I went on a, a, a tour, a speaking tour. Um, so I have lots of information about our Western butterflies and how to help them. Um, but yes, compost, worm castings for your, fertil if you're fertilizing, amending, work with compost and worm castings first. Start with a good organic soil that's usually a mix of compost and topsoil or a planting mix. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> That, that was amazing. Okay, good. Um, now I know what I'm going to do uh, this spring. Hopefully everybody else does. Um, so we're going to wind up now. I just want to remind you there. You can also, if you have questions, you can you know talk to them later. That we will be signing books, so don't 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 dominate their time. But you know you can ask them questions, and they also have their blogs too. So those are good places to communicate with them. Mine's kind of defunct though. I stopped it when I started doing the book. I couldn't do both. Okay. <laughs> Don't seek new material. You, you can find well, come to the author's yeah. gala, and you could yeah, you could talk to her, her then. But you can find me at my blog. But I'm also um, I spend most of my time on Instagram and Twitter, and I do a lot of microblogging there um, more than my blog blog because I'm such I'm spend so much time writing larger pieces and doing community outreach. But my blog is active. But Instagram and Twitter, you can find me for everyday posts uh, and information. So. Yeah. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. And thank you so much, Emily and Laura. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Lisa put this together. She had this idea. She, she, uh, we met, I just have to say this really quickly. We met at the Authors uh, uh, Gala last year, which was fabulous. And um, she said, you know, you remind me of someone. I, I need to introduce you to Laura McLively. Who I had interviewed for a story I had done at yes. the East Bay Times. Yeah, and she's like, I have to put the two of you together. And she emailed me, and she emailed Laura. She pestered us. She pestered us. She's <laughs> like, what are we going to do? And she had all these ideas. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to do something together. It's going to be great. And now, look, here we are. And it's been wonderful. And it's all because Thank of you, Lisa. Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. It was, it was so much fun. And you know what? It was exactly as much fun as I thought it would be because I knew when I got them together and they started talking that it would be a good time. So anyway, don't, don't hesitate to stop by and you know, eat some more snacks, drink some more shiso lim lim limeade, and uh, we'll see you again or hopefully next month. Thanks. Thank you.